Informatic Algebra from Linear to Concurrent Systems. Oops. Right, thank you, Noam. Um, so I'd also like to thank my co-authors, Filippo Bonchi, Josh Holland, Pavel Sobosinski, and Fabio Zanazzi. Um, and one of the motivating questions of our work has been the title of this 2006 paper by Sam Solabramski, in which he summarizes the state of concurrency theory by contrasting two approaches. On the one hand, process algebras that take a syntax-centric view of concurrency, and where the game is to define a set of primitives for concurrent programming and see how far they get you. And even if they provide useful toolkits, there's no clear winner because there's no consensus on what the canonical primitives for concurrent computations uh, are, unlike maybe for sequential computation. And on the other hand, there's Petrie's approach, uh, which, at least according to Samson, uh, tries to determine fundamental concepts and structures independently of any particular syntax. Uh, Petrie even wanted, to, wanted it to be a sort of discrete physics. Uh, but it's less appealing from a programming perspective and certainly from the point of view of this community because it's monolithic. Uh, there's no obvious way to build a specification of larger systems from, from simpler ones. So here we, I don't claim that we're going to answer Samson's question conclusively. That's obviously a very open-ended question. Um, but um, we think that we take a step in the right direction by constructing a bridge between the two approaches that he contrasts in his paper. And... The way that we're going to do this is by recycling a simple but very versatile diagrammatic language that has been used um, to model linear dynamical systems, but not only, it's been used also, a very similar graphical language has been used profitably for quantum computation, for instance. And we're going to give it a different semantics that we called resource conscious. And there we'll see that concurrent patterns of interaction emerge out of this new semantics. Then the main, resu the main result of our paper is to give a complete axiomatization for this semantics. And finally, we'll check that we land where we wanted by showing that Petrinets embed um, naturally in this new language. So I'll start with a minimal um, graphical language of boxes and wires. Uh, this might be very familiar to some of you. Uh, boxes represent here open systems, and the wires are their boundary ports. Their semantics uh, is uh, their behavior understood to be the set of interactions of a system with its environment. And to model this, we're going to fix a set X that represents the signals or resources that a system may exchange with its environment. And then the diagrams are interpreted as relations. Uh, that is, they're subsets of some product of copies of X. So immediately, um, we have a lot of additional algebraic structure to play with. And those that are familiar with this sort of thing might recognize the two compositions of monoidal categories. Um, so first, there's the parallel composition, which is represented as just juxtaposing the boxes and wires. And uh, it's interpreted as stacking up like this, the, the sets of pairs that we can observe at each port. Um, and then there's also um, what, it, what some people call sequential composition that is represented by connecting two wires. Uh, I don't like this term here because our semantics uh, is in terms of relations, make no, makes no assumption about the causal flow of information between the different parts of a diagram. So there's no sense of, in this diagram, D occurring before C in any sense. So that's why I prefer synchronizing. And really, semantically, it's better to think of, it, of, of this as variable sharing. And it's interpreted as the usual relational composition, that is by existentially quantifying over the middle variable. So this is given here for this example. And using these two operations, we can form more complex networks like these. Um, and these diagrammatic languages are, are nice because they highlight sort of physical properties of complex systems, such as the connectivity uh, of their components. And in fact, the slogan here is that um, only the connectivity should matter. Um, we want our diagrams to be insensitive in some sense um, to how these networks are drawn in the plane. And so for this, for those of you who are familiar, this will mean that we can cross wires, and this is essentially we're working in a symmetric monoidal category. And those wires behave in, those crossings behave in the way that you'd expect. Um, so the crossing here is just interpreted in our semantics as this simple swap operation. Nothing uh, groundbreaking here. But in fact, we'll want more than this. Uh, because we're interested in distributed systems and concurrency, uh, we'll want to form more complex networks of interacting components where channels may connect more than two systems together. Or none at all, if we even want to delete some part or forget about some part of the system. And our diagrammatic language should reflect 
this, by allowing us to draw these sort of hyper edges that you see here. And intuitively, it seems like we need one of these special nodes for all possible arity on the left and on the right to model this sort of multi-port connection points. But uh, it turns out we can just give ourselves a few special boxes that represent simple uh, synchronizing mechanisms that satisfy these algebraic laws that you see displayed here and that characterize the theory of special commutative Frobenius uh, monoids. So the name is not really what's important here. What's important is that there's a nice normal form theorem that just tells us that any um, two connected networks of these black dots are equal if and only if they have the same number of uh, left and right ports. So this gives us exactly what we want. And we're lucky because any set carries such structures. So we can just interpret the, the ternary black node as copying, the unary one as, as deleting, and their mirrored version as just the converse relations. So, so far, I've given you a very generic uh, graphical language for networks of interacting components, and it's perhaps not very exciting. You may have seen this before. Um, but so we'll refine it a bit by assuming more structure on the set of behaviors. And let's say now that X is a semi-ring, so it means it has two associative binary operation, operations, one of which uh, distributes over the other. And we denote um, addition by this ternary white node that you see here, and zero with the, by the unary one. And generators, we, we give ourselves one generator to represent multiplication by scalar of R for each element of the semi-ring. Um, and the, the, this Frobenius structure, the black nodes, allow us, uh, give us for free, allow us to define the syntactic sugar for the mirror image of these, of these, um, of these relations, of these diagrams, sorry, and they're interpreted by the converse relation. And equationally, um, these satisfy nice algebraic laws that express the fact that R is a semi-ring, namely white and black node form a bimonoid. If you don't know what that is, it's the, the laws are summarized here. And they essentially mean that they're sort of homomorphisms for each other, or you can slide the diagram past each other. And the scalars commute with everything in sight um, and encode the, the multiplicative and additive operations of the semi-ring. Our motivation at first was to model computation in some sense, so we would also like to add state um, to our systems. And to do so, um, we introduced this new piece of syntax that we call the register. And its operational behavior is that of a simple one-step buffer. At any given moment, it hold, if it holds a value x, it releases it to the right, to the environment, and stores whatever value it's synchronized with on the left. Um, but this new piece of syntax forces us to modify our semantics slightly. Um, we'll now work with relations with an extra state-passing variable that represents the register's change of value. A diagram from K to L, as is written here, with a S number of registers is interpreted as a relation of, of the type that you see um, in the middle. And really, these can be thought as labeled transition systems with a pair of label for the left and the right uh, for each transition. All of our previous diagrams were stateless, so we can just interpret them as having zero state passing um, variable. Only the register introduces new states, so it's interpreted uh, by the following relation, which is exactly, which reproduces exactly the operational behavior that I, uh, I described to you. Um, yeah. So now, uh, this language has seen various uses since its creation, but it was originally created to model linear dynamical systems, and that's, that's still the better understood uh, interpretation so far. So I'll go on a quick, uh, quick detour to explain this before tweaking the interpretation to capture uh, distributed systems, to capture concurrent phenomena. Um, so over a field, now so it's just a, this is just a rehash of what I've just said, essentially. Over a field K, the language captures precisely the category of linear relations. And these are relations that are closed under K linear combinations. Um, and the semantics was given a complete axiomatization in the work of uh, Filippo, Pavel, and uh, Fabio, uh, called Interacting Hop Algebras. And the gist is that with all the equations I've given you so far, if you add just these on this slide, uh, you get a complete equational theory for those linear relations. And what they say is that this um, addition node with its mirror image also forms a Frobenius monoid, exactly like the black structure. So there's a nice symmetry here. And the scalar, the scalar multiplication is invertible because these are elements of a field. And that's all you need. And this case is now very well understood, and there's all sorts of very interesting connections with classical control theory that fall out from this. Um, 
most notably, um, they generalize the original signal flow graphs of Shannon that he invented in the 40s and that are still used today by all electrical engineers and control theorists every day to specify linear systems. Um, but what's important for us is that with the same graphical language, by giving it a different interp interpretation, we'll move from the specification of linear systems to ones that exhibit concurrent patterns of interaction. So that's what interests us here. And we call that the resource um, interpretation. So to motivate this a bit further, I'll start with this diagram <clears throat> and its associated semantics, according to the rules that I gave you at the beginning. And we see that the first constraint says that whatever comes out on the right plus what is kept in the feedback loop has to be precisely what was stored in the register. So this makes sense. And over a field, say uh, the, over the reals, any pair of real value that can satisfy, any pair of real value can satisfy this assignment. Because even if R is greater than S, we can always send a negative value in the feedback loop. So the interpretation of the diagram is the whole space. And it's equal to the, the notation of the, this rather uninteresting diagram on the right. But the eureka moment for us was when we realized that over the simmering of the naturals, non-negative integers, uh, R must be smaller than S. And so this, the previous equality does not hold anymore. And it's a very simple observation, but it boils down to the fact that without additive inverses, we cannot borrow arbitrary quantities. Um, and that's, that's why we gave it the name resource interpretation. And in fact, um, over N, this, this diagram behaves exactly like the place of a Petri net. So the number of tokens is just the, the, in the place is just a number held by the register, and they all leave the register at every time step, but they can non-deterministically go on the right or be fed back to the, loop, to the register through the loop. So that's exactly the kind of asynchronous buffer that behaves like a place. Uh, so as I promised at the beginning, moving from a field to the simmering of the naturals allows for simple concurrent phenomena like this to, to emerge. Um, and we'd, we'd also like to characterize what relations now our diagrams allow us to express. Um, and our semantic domain is that of additive relations. That is, they're relations that are closed under addition and contain the origin. Um, geometrically, they're quite, um, they're quite pretty. Uh, they look like these sort of lattices embedded in some, some power of N. Um, they, do, they do have the suitable structure to be asymmetric. They do form a symmetric monoidal category. Um, and in fact, the, but the, the proof that they compose is actually uh, non-trivial. And the main result of our paper is um, a complete axiomatization of uh, additive relations in terms of this equational theory that we call the resource calculus. And again, so if you take all the equations from earlier, minus the ones that were specific to linear relations, so these, you get these back nodes with the, the hypergraph structure and you get the semi-ring uh, equations. Um, and you add these, they, they express the fact that, uh, so the first set of them, the white nodes, express the fact that addition and its dual now form a bimonoid and not another Frobenius monoid like for the linear interpretation. And the crucial bit here is this, this, this middle equation, the unary ones, that, um, that say that n is non-negative, which essentially says that if the sum of two things is equal to zero, well, those two things better be zero. Um, and then we have these slightly stranger looking laws that uh, express the cancellativity of addition in N and uh, some property of the order of the order on N, namely that any two natural numbers have a common upper bound. And finally, we have that multiplication has a one-sided inverse and not a two-sided one like we had for linear relations because we're not working over a field. So we can multiply and then divide, but the opposite might not land you where you started. Um, and so I started talking about Petrines earlier. Um, and let's see now how they embed uh, in the resource calculus. So using the syntactic sugar for the place, which we know from earlier uh, is expressed by this diagram, we can just use black nodes for transitions um, and white nodes to write down places with more than one input and one output. Um, as a corollary of the completeness result, we get that the firing semantics of a Petronet is the same as the semantics of its corresponding diagram. So not only can we express Petronets, but we obtain a sort of compositional theory of them. And in fact, we get for free not only the closed ones, closed, the closed diagrams that represent Petronets, but we can also open them and see that we have open Petronets with uh, dangling transitions, if you will. 
Um, and we can reason about their behavior equationally using the resource calculus. Um, so the moral of the story, and so I, I don't want you to take away from this talk that I've given you yet uh, another process algebra, just with pictures this time. I think what's interesting about this story here is that we can capture different kinds of computational models, so from, from a, starting from very simple diagrammatic primitives. Um, we saw the linear dynamical systems, and that's all the work, and we see now that we can capture a broader range of behavior by modifying the semantics, and so how the equational theory is modified as a consequence of that. Um, but there's, there's much more to be done, um, and there are a lot of possible directions for future research. Uh, we think of the resource calculus really as an assembly language to study various kinds of computational models. Um, first of all, it's, it's more expressive uh, than Petrinets. And we would, we would really like to sort of see how to embed and compile different uh, process algebras into it and to study them. Another thing that we've done, that's the first point here, is that uh, we have written up a paper about an affine extension of this language where you give yourself uh, an extra constant that represents the constant resource one. And uh, in the linear interpretation, this captures affine spaces as you'd, ex as you'd expect. But in the resource interpretation, this gives a domain of discrete polyhedra um, that is, gives you a compositional language essentially to talk about discrete polyhedra. And it's surprisingly powerful, allows you to specify a boundedness. For instance, you can move from uh, PT nets, P3 nets that I've showed you here to, um, to bounded nets and you can talk about mutual exclusion in this language, which surprisingly is now an affine, is discovered to be an affine phenomenon. Um, there are some limitations. Uh, the stateful semantics we give is clearly too fine. In concurrency, we care about by simulation, or at least trace equivalence. Um, and we think, so in, we think this is a, at least trace equivalence is approachable using streams of, um, of integers and we're working on this at the moment. Finally, there's um, many model checking problems about distributed systems that can be formulated in terms of Petri net reachability. And we're wondering whether compositionality can help in this, can help in this task. It's already helped um, in the finite state case of C nets, so nets that, where the places can contain at most one token. Can, one of the questions that we have is, can we extend this um, to regular, regular Petri nets, and can that help us to do this? That's all. Thank you for thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Robin. Uh, so again, please raise your hand if you have questions. Uh, I'm going to start with a question on Slido, which I think you just uh, just answered, but you can you can answer okay. some more maybe. So so the question is from Ed on Slido. Uh, process algebra and Petri nets can be used to do program analysis by using types or infinite state model checking. Can your work inform program analysis? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, well, we're hoping to do so. So there's a tool that Pavel developed called Penrose that um, does model checking using these ideas from, using these compositional ideas for the case of, of CE nets, so elementary net systems that have a place that can contain at most one token. Um, and one of the ideas is to use similar ideas to extend this to Petri nets um, that are unbounded, and this would help, yeah, provide a sort of compositional model checking uh, using these ideas. The problem is that uh, reachability for um, general Petri nets is a very complicated algorithm, so we're not sure yet um, how to actually implement these ideas. Uh, it's definitely something that we're looking into. Uh, yes. Um, can you say more about the semantics of open Petri nets in your framework? So if you take an open Petri net in this setting and encode it, what kind of relation do you get? What does the relation tell you? Um, so you get with those stateful relations that I showed earlier, uh, and their semantics are in terms of these. So there's this, you can think of them as those two, two labeled transition systems. And in particular for a Petri net, they're additive in the sense that I gave earlier. Um, there has been some work on this on this topic. There's been many work. There's a lot of work uh, to open Petri nets and decompose them. And in fact, the one that we the ones that we get from this picture are uh, the same as those. That, if you're familiar with that, um, Bruni and Pavel Sobosinski and Tanara gave 
uh, up to a technical detail because I think this one is better. <laughs> uh, they get, yeah, they gave it slightly wrong. Um, but it, uh, yeah, it's this, it, we end up on the same thing. Other questions? Uh, I had w one question about, you mentioned at the beginning about uh, how relational composition is not sequential, but just synchronizing. Uh, yeah. And have you thought about sequentiality? Um, yes, so this, this language um, is obviously not a programming language, right? It's not, there's no, because the relational composition has some form of unbounded non-determinism. Um, and studying where causality makes sense in those diagrams is a very interesting problem. And it's been studied in the linear case by Filippo and Fabio. And they gave a sort of realizability theorem for the linear case by saying that essentially says every diagram can be interpreted as having a consistent causal flow that you can discover. And it's, causal flow becomes something that you discover in the, in the diagram. Um, so we don't have this yet for those, this resource uh, interpretation. Um, so yeah, it's definitely something that is definitely one of the next steps that, we're, that we'd like to explore. Um, extend sort of reliability theorem to, to, um, to this resource interpretation. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And I, uh, let's thank uh, Robin again. <laughs>